What you want to talk to me about, Mama? Okay. Whoa! I'm gonna break my ass in this damn chair. Hey, what's up? This is your girl, Diamond. Um, every time I come to the Trans Faith Summit, I see this man here. And he's such an inspiration to me, being a trans person, being a man, um, that I've always wanted to share it with my audience. And because of we are participating <laughs> in, in the program of the Trans Faith Summit and Conference, we never really have the time to sit down and talk, but it's late and we're both up. I called him. Sorry, <laughs> we're here. And this, I want to introduce you all to Lewis Mitchell. Greetings, greetings. Minister Lewis Mitchell. <sighs> Lewis Mitchell. This is Lewis is fine. Lewis. <laughs> yeah. This is one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah. When I first um, met him, his energy was just so... I felt like I met a kindred spirit, mm -hmm. somebody who was real, who was articulate, who was um, adept in life enough mm -hmm. to minister, adept in life enough um, on both ends to be able to touch uh, so many people. And, you know, I feel like I'm one of those people and I appreciate it. Well, thank you. So, the admiration goes in both directions. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um... I want you to tell the people about you. Oh, God. Well, the most important thing for me right now is I just became a new daddy. Oh, My baby girl is uh, a month and five days old now, and uh, my wife and I, our first baby, and I'm just overjoyed. It's uh, My life right now looks like a dream that I had as a child that I knew would never come true. Um, I'm happy. I'm the man that I always wanted to be, and I'm a husband and a father, and uh, I feel like I won the lottery. <sighs> That's such like a, just the thought of it is a joy. It's amazing. Um, it's scary a little bit though. Terrifying, too. terrifying. Because it's like, now I gotta put up and shut up because I have a fresh being coming into the yes, earth that yes. I have. All these things that, you know, we come from a place where people are instilling these things right, right. that we have to undo once we, right. now is our place to do that to someone. Yeah. Uh, what mistakes am I going to make? What am I going to impart? What am I going to do? That's, that's, that's it's a big terrifying. responsibility. It's terrifying. I mean, during, I mean, because so much of the world is gendered, uh, people say, oh, what did you have? What did you have? What did you have? And my wife and I tell them, well, we have a baby girl until and unless she tells us otherwise. Mm. And if she says she's something other than that, then that's what we're rolling with. And um, and so I feel like I'm so grateful to have had the life I've had so that this young wife has the opportunity to be and do whatever they want with my support and mm -hmm. my care. And I want her to be able to sample a number of spiritual beliefs and sample a no number of styles of music and styles of art and, and see a number of places and to be able to have a full, rich menu to choose and form herself. Right. And if she's a dyke, if she's a trans person, great, wonderful. I know exactly how to support that. And, exactly. and she will be, she'll meet some of everybody. And uh, I can only imagine that her heart and her mind will be open so that in her young adulthood, she won't be all caught up with all the bigotry that many folks face. I'm really excited about the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Makes me want to be a little bit healthier so I can live longer see, and grow up. See, <sighs> How long have you been trans? Um, I started my transition on my 39th birthday, mm. and I just turned 52 this week. Okay. So, 13 years. Okay. Is it fulfilling? Fulfilling doesn't even really do it justice. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there's a certain kind of schizophrenic feeling that I felt that the world saw me in a way that, that I never saw myself, you know? And that first moment of walking down the street and having people see me as I saw myself was otherworldly. Mm. It was like, I felt like a little kid. Yeah. It was so exciting. I literally just cleaned. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's been fulfilling, and part of what has been fulfilling for me, well, I, let me just back up for a second. In my early transition, I found no black men who were mm -hmm. trans. All the guys I knew who were transitioning were white guys. Then I met three. 
the first one was... Where did they live? The three that you met that were African American? All on the West Coast. Okay. The first one I met was just an ass. And I thought, if that's what testosterone is going to do to me, I'm not sure I want to do it. Mm. The other two suicided within a year of each other. And, and that changed me in some ways. And that has been the seed of my kind of activism because at that point... Had the, they transitioned and... and they had been there. transitioned. Oh, gosh. They were transitioned, well-established, married, had kids. Uh, and I, I don't know what the reasoning was or what the cause yeah. was. They had some mental health concerns. Um, I, don't, I didn't know them deeply enough to know. But I did know that at that point I wanted to do everything I could to make sure that none of us had to be alone. We might, have cho we might choose to be alone. Um, but we never had to. And so my kind of last decade has been about bringing guys together and forming organizations and making sure there's a, a support network for guys, whether they're d stealth or non-disclosed or out or whatever, so that we all have someone that we can lean, t lean on and talk real talk with. Right. Um, and that's been my mission to do. And events like this, when I look around the room and I see the guys that... I know that I've been some small part of their transition, whether they've seen the film, or whether I met them, or I was the first out black trans man they met. met. Um, that makes all of this, that's what fulfills me. Well, honestly, um, you're the first black trans man that I had. Uh, um, prior to meeting you, every trans man that I would met, there was a weirdness in our um, interaction. Mm -hmm. It was almost, like they didn't talk to me mm -hmm. they didn't we didn't have any kind of dialogue or mm -hmm. shared fruit mm -hmm. it was nothing like that so meeting you it was just a just fresh air i was like this is an ally this is somebody right. i didn't feel like i feel like you're my brother right right from the same experience right right but when it prior to that i it seemed like all they were almost standoffish almost like you're not a real woman right well we had that discussion right with, with some of my guys um, because, you know, lately there have been so many folks, trans men and trans women dating and coupling and things like that. And, and I think when, and I won't speak to the trans feminine experience, I can't, but in the trans masculine experience, I think there is an overcompensation that happens when we transition, mm -hmm. where we try to become these uber men, you know what I mean, and just hard and eh. And we take on all of the negative aspects of the men in our culture, including the homophobia and the transphobia. And what I've submitted to the guys... Sometimes I unknowingly. To, I don't even know if it's annoying. I mean, I, <laughs> I think it's intentional because that's what you, you mirror the men in your society. And if the men in your society are homophobic and transphobic, and many of them are, that's what you will mirror because you, you are so... Your manhood is so fragile that you can't have anything that anybody can poke and say, oh, you're not really a real man. You like those people. And one of, my, one of my trans brothers, a few of them over the years, but the first one, was interested in someone who was a trans woman and said, well, I could only date her if she's had bottom surgery. And I said, so what I heard you say was that you're not a man because you don't have a dick. That's what I heard you say. That's what you just said. And, and he said, no, that's what I said. No, I said, that's what you said. I said, because you're telling me that this woman isn't a woman because of her parts and pieces, but you want her to see you as a man because of yours? doesn't make any sense. Regardless of yours. And, and it's one of those things that we have to grow and understand that, that ours is a, is a shared currency, that we're, we're opposite sides of the same coin, and that the places where we connect not only will help us grow as a community, as a people, but will connect us broadly. We, we are those shamans, those links between all of these different structures. And as we grow to have community with one another, which I am grateful to say is growing by leaps and bounds, oh, I, uh, I'm gratified because we are each other's hope. You know, everybody doesn't have the good fortune of being able to blend in society easily and move freely through the world without harm. But what would happen if those who are the most vulnerable, um, like the women in, in you know, the Northeast and Northwest and D.C. are getting mowed down every damn weekend. Mm -hmm. um, what would happen if we set up a network of the trans men in that area who served as brothers to those trans women? So whether they were going on a date or not, you know, they say, hey, I'm going to meet this dude who I have, I have not met before. If you don't hear from me by midnight, this is where I am. Right. You know, that kind of support in real time is what's needed to sustain the most vulnerable. 
in our community. And at the moment, the most vulnerable are trans women. You know, they are, whatever is happening to us, whether we're stealth or not, we're not getting mowed down just in the interest of trying to find love and companionship. Mm -hmm. Not the way trans women are every weekend. And it needs to be our business and our concern. So I work towards that in a lot of ways um, because really for me that's what men do. Men care for the community and men care for the safety of the community and our, our elders and our children and our women and our women, sisters, cousins, lovers, whatever our women are. And we, we need to step into that role a little bit better. What are some things that, specific issues that you are trying to tackle currently. Now, of course, you're going to tackle right. a lot because it's a complex. Right. Um, I did a um, workshop with Valerie, and one of the things she said is that we have the right to be complex. We are complex beings. Mm -hmm. What are some things like right now in your current life right now that you are working on? Really, the biggest part is really community building because there's still so much need for that. Right. The secondary part of that is really creating access to basic health needs. Um, one of the things, when I lobby in D.C., um, I, I don't talk about trans stuff one in terms one. of, well, yeah, not even trans one one, but not even like, you know, trans inclusion and protections. I ask, I try to ask them to do something they can do, which is work with the insurance lobbyists and give us the opportunity to have more freedom. So in the state of Massachusetts, you can change your you can change your gender marker on your insurance at will, mm. which means that if I need to go in for a Pap smear, I call down the office and say I'm getting a Pap smear tomorrow. They change it to an F. I get my Pap smear. When I leave the office, they change it back to an M. Mm. So I don't get charged for it. I don't have any extra loopholes. I mean, those of us that have transitioned, you know, trans women need to be able to go and have a prostate exam. Trans women, trans men need to be able to go and have. Uh, a pap smear if we still have those parts and pieces because we've worked too hard to die of like ovarian and prostate cancer because we can't go get tested without outing ourselves. Yes. And as we get older, Look, we have to. I have to say this to y'all. You know what's going on with your body. Your transition because you there was an issue there. Mm -hmm. You have pro If you're a trans woman, you have a prostate. Mm -hmm. You have to get that checked. If you're a trans man, you know what you have. Mm -hmm. You have to get that checked. Don't be so stuck in your transition that you don't feel exposed to those things as those by you can't get around that and you have to get a check i mean as we get older and as we grow we have the luxury of living as men and living as women and it's easy because we want to forget that we weren't born this way right um but our biology will tell on us and and i don't want to see any of us die needlessly right. there's a lot of focus on trans youth and trans children one of the focuses that i'm moving into is more about trans elders so in my generation, I'm 50. we're getting older. Well, we're and getting that's older. that's a blessing. But. Living longer. I'm even talking about the people that preceded us. So in my generation, I'm 52. There became, you know, a transgender life. I mean, prior to that, it was called a lot of things. But there was really no such thing. So our elders are 60 and 70 who were taught that if you transition, you move away from your family, you cut off everybody. They're in nursing homes being misgendered, not getting hormones. Unshamed. They don't have They don't have any family around. Mm -hmm. The nursing staff is not in any way sensitive or trained. I would love to see an opportunity for us to do a bit of a census mm -hmm. to find our people. It may mean going to the old bars where they used to hang out for 30 years before they transitioned. And You know, many of us started out, you know, in, in my generation and before, many of us started out as drag queens or as butches. Not all of us, but many of us. Mm -hmm. So there's still somebody somewhere that knows our origin. And if we can hunt each other down, then we can give care. We can go in to the nursing homes and be their family. We can um, monitor how they're being treated and if they're being referred to with the proper pronouns and given their hormones or the care that they need, that they're getting shaved, that they're being uh, addressed as who they've become. Um, without that, it'll never happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I fear that it has you know, not been happening for so long, but I am... Um, I'm committed to that, and I'm also committed to the notion that people like me and, and the folks coming after me, if we can find them and we can hear their stories, I mean, what a gift. What a gift for them to be recognized as our leaders and our trailblazers, and what a gift to us to have that history back. Mm -hmm. Our history is MIA. We, we don't have a history. 
And what history we do have has been stolen by the larger gay and lesbian movement who have hijacked Stonewall as being their event when really... We started. Yeah. I mean, you know, Stonewall, Compton's, what's the place in Houston? There's another cafeteria in Houston where folks had to sit in, much like Compton's and Stonewall. It, it's always been the people who had the least to lose that were willing to risk the most. Mm -hmm. And the privileged folks who, you know, were in their lofty towers hiding out, wearing hankies in their back pockets so they could find each other, um, they benefited from us, and yet they still try to erase us from history. So we have to reclaim our history, which means we have to find it, we have to know it, and we have to teach it. So what will your legacy be? Whew, my legacy. Uh, it's too soon to tell. Yeah, you got I, a baby girl. <laughs> I have a baby girl, and I have a, a wealth of sons and nephews and little brothers that are my legacy. That um, I can't. Every time I see them, it just makes my heart swell. I'm so pleased and proud of the lives that they've created for themselves, and and the opportunity to be there for them and to be a support to them has meant the world to me. At the moments when I feel the most fragile and depressed and occasionally suicidal, I remember that um, people look to me to be the strong shoulder and to be the elder for them, and I can't abandon them. That keeps me stable to the planet. Mm -hmm. Now explain that to me. How is a person that's so self-assured have moments of that suicidal moment? How do you have that? Uh, it's, uh, you know, I have doubt. Mm -hmm. I have doubt. I have moments of fear and desperation. Um, I have critical self-judgment that tells me, oh, I'm 52, I should have this, I should be that, I should, you know, ah, I'm never going to make this work, and this and that and the other. It's momentary and it's fleeting, mm -hmm. more now than ever, but there are still those moments when, when it feels like the pressure of life is just too damn hard. You know, everything is a battle. You know, uh, racism here and transphobia there and this, that, and this, and that, and fat phobia. And, you know, it's just like, wow, really? I just need a moment of peace. And I usually find that moment of peace, but in between those feelings and that moment of peace, uh, it feels very bleak. Mm -hmm. And the things that I use to sustain me, I mean, my baby was just born, so I didn't have her to sustain me until now, but the things that I use to sustain me have been my brothers and the brotherhood that we're building. And and the fact that I want to be there for them. I want to be there for them. There are guys that, that I meet that they aren't even guys yet. You know, I'm out. I'm really out. So when I'm out and I tell people that I'm a trans man, you see light bulbs go off and people are like, oh my God, oh my God, there's one right there in front of me that I can talk to. And, 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 that, and that opportunity to connect them with other guys for support, um, it just makes all the difference. You know, and... Uh, they think that I'm doing something for them, but in fact, they are doing the world for me. Mm. They, they sustain me. Yeah. I basically answer my phone and respond to an email. I ain't really <laughs> doing nothing that important. <laughs> but their hope and the courage that they give me to keep going is what keeps me you know, on the planet. So. Well, I'm glad. I'm, I, definitely, you definitely inspire me. You definitely, when I, when I met you, I, when I met you and a few other people, it just inspired me that, okay, I have a team. I'm part, I may yes. not see y'all but once a year, <laughs> well, hey. but I have a team. Yeah. Twice that, a year, because we saw each other in Dallas. Yeah, that's true. I, it's, it, I felt like I was a part of a team that had all these strings everywhere, and we're trying to pull something together, and it made me proud. It made me... It just put a fire under my ass. <laughs> That's what we're here for, so baby. Do stuff. You know, we're a family, and as we come together and build this family, one of the things that we learn is that family love each other. We fall out, we fight, we disagree, we come together and break bread. Like, you know, that really pissed me off. That really hurt my feelings. Come on, girl, let's go have lunch now. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't allow petty separations to keep us from being the family that we are. Yeah. And that works again. That works. In, in the favor of our oppressors, it doesn't work for us. Not at 